Good afternoon, everyone. We're here today in the next installment of our female executive leadership series, sitting down with Farah Siragar. She's the managing director for ASEAN at Corteva AgriScience. So you've had a distinguished career, still with much more to come, and we very much look forward to hearing your stories today, Farah. To start with, share with us, Farah, a story that's really unique to being a woman. First, it's really about uh, being confident and enjoying my journey personally. And then the second is really around uh, driving gender diversity. So firstly, uh, to all of the women out there, uh, please be sure that you enjoy your growth journey and be confident. Uh, stop doubting yourself, be bold and uh, stay positive. Because um, believe me, I, I'm, I'm an expert uh, warrior. So not a warrior, like a warrior, like I worry a lot. I would go into the meetings and, and there would be these voices in my head, you know, um, overthinking. Was that good enough? Was that clear enough? Did I make the right decision? What do people think about me? So uh, as I reflect back on my career journey, 90% of the time I'm kind of moving uh, into a leadership role right before or right after a male counterpart, a male leader. And what I've noticed is that while I've done just as well or even in some cases better than them, they seem to have enjoyed the journey so much more than I I did with so much less anxiety, so much less self-doubt. And I actually re uh, read the book Lean In that read Sheryl Sandberg, the CFO of Facebook. She actually has the same worries, the same self-doubt. And studies have shown that actually female has uh, more of those traits inherently versus male. So that was kind of an aha moment for me because that uh, I feel that I'm not alone, that I can manage this. My second reflection is really around uh, driving gender diversity. and. And I feel like it's really about ensuring that uh, women have a clear voice at the decision table to challenge the status quo and to kind of bust the well-meaning and uh, unconscious bias. But oftentimes, I'm the only female leader in the table. So I've seen quite a few of these comments that says, well, but should we give her the opportunity now? She just had a baby or she has young children, you know, mm -hmm. and something like this would never come up in a discussion for male talent. So I think overall, it's really about challenging the status quo in a very positive way in, in agriculture, the industry I'm in. And I'm very happy to say that today we have 50% gender diversity in our core commercial um, unit leadership team and more than 30% in our extended cross-function leadership team. You've shown that it can be done, especially in a historically male-dominated yeah. industry as agriculture, which brings us to the next question. Uh, the generation of women behind you, what do you think their yeah. biggest challenge is? change uh, has really been a constant in the business world for uh, for quite some time. But COVID-19 recently has taken it up to a whole new level. So I think the biggest challenge is actually how to lead in the times of uncertainty, how to develop an agile and resilient team. There is a McKinsey article uh, that talks about how change um, uh, can be especially difficult for very successful leaders because they are finally um, faced with this kind of fear that things are not working, their success formula is not working in the new normal. I think that um, more than ever in the dynamic world, uh, we need leaders that we have the ability to recognize the fears, recognize the risks, and how we can actually still deliver on our goal and be successful. Female leaders are relatively more reflective and more collaborative in their decision-making process. And that actually means that it will be easier for them to adopt into this positive thinking leadership style. So I think this is an opportunity for all the female leaders, next generation female leaders out there to actually play out your strength, right? And, you know, be ready to lead in a time of change. Can you think during your journey, a uh, key leadership lesson you've experienced or gone through yourself? I think one of the key um, things for me personally is that um, IQ alone uh, will, will not cut it. If you're the smartest person on the table in your team, then you are in real trouble, okay? So I think really good leaders really don't believe that they have all the answers. Uh, it's really about being humble, uh, having the humility to know yourself, what you can do and what you cannot do. And I think uh, through my journey uh, today, what I've really learned is that being a good leader is really about having the foresight to uh, know and uh, uh, find the vision of what winning looks like, uh, understanding what are the steps, what does it take to win, and most importantly, who do I need on my team to make it happen? So it's about ensuring that I have a really diverse set of team members around me who are much smarter than me in different ways and complementary ways, and then harnessing and uh, all and embracing all of their 
brain powers and experiences to really collectively deliver and win. So clearly you're passionate about being a leader. Uh, maybe outside of that, what energizes you the most? I really feel very fortunate to be in the you know, in the agriculture industry. I get to travel to the most beautiful farming areas across ASEAN. And most importantly, I get to meet really the kindest, the most down-to-earth, most inspiring farmers. So about a year ago, I'll tell you just a, a story. I was in the I was in the Philippines and um, we were launching an education farm with the Department of Agriculture. We educate them and bring them the latest technology so that they can improve their yield. We invited one of our corn farmers, uh, this um, female par- farmer. I was learning more about her story, her journey. About 10 years back, she was worried about how to feed her family, support her family, because it's devastating when you don't even own your own land. You're leasing your land and you you know, you you know lose your harvest, right? Uh, so she started working with our agronomy team to have better uh, harvest and yield. She started saving her money little by little and then start buying up land. And here she was 10 years later, you know, she has her land. She's a, a presidential awardee. She is also contributing back to her rural community. So I think what really energized me the most is knowing that the work that my team does all across ASEAN at the farmer's level can really make a real change in people's lives. So beyond dollar and cents. You've talked us through a lot of your journey. Along that way, what, if anything, have you had to sacrifice? I think the most difficult one is actually precious time with my son. I have a 19-year-old son. He is my priority. So I remembered when he was younger, it was very difficult for me. Whenever I had to go for a business trip, I would feel so guilty. In fact, to tell you the truth, I was feeling guilty all the time. I was questioning, like, am I making the right choices? Am I a good enough mother? Yeah. Um, So early on, my, my mother, my mom, who is also my best friend, she shared with me really good advice that... um to focus on quant- quality versus quantity to ensure that <clears throat> that he really feels the unconditional love and that he knows that you'll be there for him. I'm not going to be the mom who can be there with you every day when you come home from school, but I'm definitely going to be that mom who will never miss an important you know, event in your life. I remember like really scheduling it into my, uh, my schedule and to never miss. Additionally, I think uh, it really does take a village uh, to raise a child. I think Hillary Clinton wrote that book. Uh, you know, so I, I can only do what I do to be a leader and a mother because I have such a great support system around me, right? Um, my husband, he's a wonderful dad. He takes more than equal share of taking care of my son. I had wonderful support from my parents, my parents-in-law. They're always more than happy to, to lend a hand. Um, so I think uh, I, I feel very, very uh, fortunate What's another piece of advice you've received that's really sort of had a big effect on you? So the best, even life-changing advice I have ever received was actually from my current um, line manager, uh, Peter Ford, president of Corteva in Asia Pacific. Um, And the advice was to simply take care of my wellness. And a couple of times he reminded me, I kind of rolled my eyes thinking, I'm fine, what are we talking about here, right? Uh, So then he and a colleague of mine nominated me to attend this excellent two, two and a half days wellness workshop program by uh, Johnson & Johnson Human Performance Institute, um, where I really learn about managing my energy through um, the wellness pyramid. So after the workshop, I actually started to just simply, you know, exercise every day, manage my sleep better. Um, I improve my eating habits, but, you know, just slightly. And, and the re- result was just phenomenal. I think in terms of the level of energy that I have, and how it impacted just my overall happiness uh, and my ability, therefore, to be more positive and resilient and agile emotionally and mentally when I'm facing challenges in at work and at home. So my mantra for myself and my team now is that wellness is equal to best performance. During this journey and during this um, growth you've had in your career in different locations and countries, what are some ways uh, you've gained confidence in yourself as a leader? Unfortunately, I'm not born with it. You know, I think some people are born with it. I actually needed to work on it. Um, so I built that up over time. And then I think like a few things that really shaped um, my confidence is kind of having the humility to know that I am not perfect. And then the second thing is that knowing that there will be time that no matter how hard I try, I will fail yeah, from time to time. And, and But having that knowledge as well that I have the strength and the ability to really learn from my mistake and turn around and rebound from failure. The second is like, I was a math major, so some of the learning clearly kind of stuck with me. 
So to stay confident, sometimes I also um, remind myself that look, every problem, no matter how complicated it may seem, can really broken down into little pieces, and you can address it systematically by size. So, um, so I think you know, confidence for me is really doesn't mean that I don't have fears and I don't get nervous. It's really the realization that uh, with whatever fears I have, I also have the strength. Uh, to actually face them and to actually overcome them. That's how I, I think, gain my confidence uh, over time. To get to know you as well. But let's start with this. So how do you unplug? So I love music and I love dancing and, and I, I embarrass my son all the time, you know, with my dancing, but you know, but I, I do at least one hour of uh, Zumba and or cardio dance session uh, every day. That's how I unplug. Hopefully this, um quarantine period will will get back to normal soon um in the next couple of months once it does what's your your holiday destination of choice um i would probably say for sure bali swimming in the sea nothing really beats being kind of in the water looking at the you know the endless blue uh because it makes me feel small and it makes me feel that all my problems are actually very small as well it puts everything into perspective last question be honest with this. In the last couple of months we've been home, what's your favorite home indulgence that you allow yourself? I have really easy access to my fridge and ice cream. Uh, instead of going for coffee like I usually do, I step it up, you know, nowadays and I do coffee ice cream with the, all the sprinkles and the cones and everything like that. Really appreciate the the sincerity of your stories um, and it's fantastic that you're open to share with us. So thank you very much. Very happy to be sharing. Thank you.